Good afternoon. For us, there is nothing optional about black experience and or black studies, wrote the gifted writer, activist, teacher, and longtime member of the African American Studies Department here at UC Berkeley, June Jordan. This is in from her 1969 essay, Black Studies, Bringing Back the Person. Jordan continued, black studies, life studies, Life appealing to live and to be and to know a community that will protect the living simply because we are alive. This is the menace to university curriculum and standards. This is the possibility of survival we all must embrace. The possibility of life, as has been said, by whatever means necessary. Welcome to the Black Studies Open University the spring event series of the Abolition Democracy Fellows Program of the Black Studies Collaboratory housed in the Department of African American Studies here at UC Berkeley. Today's program caught caring, unfreedom and the costs of service labor in the university curated by Abolition Democracy dissertation writing fellow Caleb E. Dawson is the second of nine events in our Black Studies Open University spring series. My name is Lee Rayford. I'm a professor of African American Studies and along with Dr. Tiana S. Pichel, co-director of the Black Studies Collaboratory. The BSC is a three-year initiative to explore and amplify the world-building work of black studies. With generous funding from the Andrew Mellon Foundation, uh, their Just Futures initiative, we have, over the course of the first two years of this grant, welcomed artists, activists, archivists, and elders to, into the campus community. We have produced a robust event series in partnership with units on campus around the Bay and across the country. We have awarded some 30 grants of about $5,000 each to students, faculty, and staff supporting innovative black-centered collaborative projects, more than a third of which have um, involved collaboration with off-campus partners. We have supported the research and development of more than two dozen black feminist scholars around the country and across the globe. And we are building long-term partnerships with black-centered Bay Area organizations that are doing phenomenal work in health, education, art, and food justice. And you can find out more about our work at our website, blackstudiescollab.berkeley.edu. So we are here at the Berkeley Art Museum, at the threshold of UC Berkeley campus and the city of Berkeley. We are, on the site, we are sited on the territory of the Huchun, the ancestral and unceded land of the Chochenyo speaking Ohlone people, the successors of the historic and sovereign Verona band of Alameda County. We recognize that every member of the Berkeley community, both town and gown, has and continues to benefit from the use and occupation of this land since the institution's founding in 1868. In acknowledging the Ohlone history of this land, we acknowledge that the Ohlone people are thriving, members of the Berkeley community who are actively imagining more just futures and engaging the tools that are needed to do that imaginative work. One way to make concrete such acknowledgement is through the payment of Shumi land tax, a material way for non-indigenous people living in the East Bay to participate in the rematriation of land to indigenous people. And you can find out more about Shumi through the Saugarea Te Land Trust. So this series, the Black Studies Open University, is an effort to better understand the history and future of black life on stolen lands. And today's panel in particular asks us to think about the work of making often uninhabitable, un, excuse me, making inhospitable places livable. It imagines the material and psychic costs of seeking freedom in spaces that structurally are not committed to our survival. We believe that black studies offers us the tools to embrace the possibility of life, as June Jordan wrote. And given the, rigor, the vigorous fight to ban critical race theory, African American studies, intersectional thought, and other black studies epistemologies from any and all places of learning, 
it is clear that the right wing believes and indeed fears the power of black studies too. The Black Studies Open University is a commitment to black studies as a public good. We are inspired by the legacy of community campus pedagogical partnerships, like the Afro-American Association Reading Group of the 1960s and the undergraduate-led democratic education at Cal courses. By SNCC's freedom schools and the political education classes of the Black Panther Party, and we take our name from the Open University of the UK, spearheaded by the late, great Stuart Hall, whose work provides an example of the pinnacle of intellectual pursuits performed for the public and in the public interest. So too is the Black Studies Open University a recognition that knowledge is produced, circulated, and put into use in a range of locations, from the kitchen table to the seminar room, from the street corner to the concert stage, from the prison cell to the lecture podium. Above all, and I will say this every week, the Black Studies Open University is an invitation to a mode of study that is always social and necessarily collaborative. It's an invitation to dream together and practice for no new, more just ways of living. So we hope that you will continue to join us as often as you can throughout the series, bring friends, et cetera. Um, before I introduce Caleb, who will be moderating today's panel, I want to thank the beautiful collective of people who've made today and this series possible. Um, as always, it's just a gift to be here partnering at, uh, with Berkeley Art Museum and the Pacific Archive to be here in the Osher Theater, uh, the museum helmed by director Julie rodriguez Widom, and the Osher Theater team, especially uh, Nat Rees, uh, Taylor McAllister, Dave Taylor, Taylor Coburn, and the whole Bamfa staff. I want to thank always BSC project manager extraordinaire, Barbara Montana. Um, I want to say, you know, like in the high school graduation, it's hold your applause to the end, but like <laughs> black folks never do. So whatever you do you. Um, but I'm going to thank, a lot of thanks, uh, BSC graduate student assistants, Francesca Araujo and Alexandra Gassese the Department of African American Studies, helmed brilliantly by Chair Professor Nikki Jones, with incredible staff support from Sandy Richmond, Lindsay Villarreal, and Maria Eredia. Our ASL interpreters today, Kat, who is at my, uh, to my left, and Alina from Pro Bono ASL, the Andrew Mellon Foundation. I want to thank today's panelists. Doctors Adia Harvey Wingfield and Dr. Bianca C. Williams. And I, I just have to also say that um, Dr. Williams was uh, my first graduate student that I ever taught when I was a postdoc uh, at Duke. So it is really incredible to see you here, to welcome you here. We want to thank the ancestors without whom nothing is possible and on whose shoulders we stand. And we want to thank all of you for joining us today. Um, and I want to thank dissertation writing fellow Caleb E. Dawson for thoughtfully curating today's event. I'm going to introduce Caleb and then I'm going to hand it over to Caleb um, shortly. Um, but Caleb is well known to many on Cal campus. Caleb is a community organizer, a dancer, a black feminist ethnographer from Federal Way, Washington. Caleb indulges in reimagining and redistributing state-sanctioned resources to build life-affirming institutions that sustain state-forsaken peoples. A PhD candidate in critical studies of race, class, and gender, Caleb engages in humanistic social science research about anti-blackness in higher education and the myriad ways black folks survive and create life amidst anti-black social structures. His dissertation, ethnographically investigates what it takes for black campus leaders to contest anti-blackness at the University of California, Berkeley, uh, focusing on the years 2014 to 2022, and that work is not a notion, y'all. Um, in doing so, Caleb analyzes the challenges and supports black leaders, um, uh, challenges and supports black leaders encounter, as well as how gender and organizational status, position, uh, and shape experiences of possibility 
and in some cases, uh, create problems. <laughs> Beyond his dissertation, Caleb's research agenda addresses the racialized and gendered political economies of for-profit colleges and student loan debt. And most recently, Caleb has been awarded a prestigious and competitive UC Presidential Postdoctoral Fellowship. And for the next two years, we'll be in residence at UC Merced under the mentorship of Dr. Laura Hamilton. Caleb has planned a special event for us today. Um, and I just want to say that this, this event will end promptly at 2.30 PM. Um, and we will need to vacate the theater right after. But we invite folks to continue the conversation, uh, as I know there will be, um, in the atrium, which is just outside of the theater down the steps. Um, uh, until I think, well, not necessarily in perpetuity, but um, at least at least until three, y'all. Um, okay, and with that, I hand it over to Caleb Dawson. Good afternoon again. Y'all, I'm so excited to be here with you. Um, I want to say a major thank you again to the Black Studies Collaboratory for truly creating the conditions, material and social, for me to dream about my work and dream with other black folk who care deeply about black folk. Um, I also want to thank my partner, Lee Mighty, for continuing to care for how I'm doing more so than what I'm doing. That's always such a helpful reminder. Um, and thank you to the audience here, y'all. I'm so excited that you are here, especially our black community members who have shaped so profoundly the work that I do and make me look really good. Like, Truly, you'll hear some more um, from them later. And before I introduce our panelists, I want to say a little bit about how we got here, how we got to an event about unfreedom and the costs of caring at UC Berkeley in 2023. Well, despite nine statewide bans on considering race in, in admissions, beginning with California's Proposition 209 in 1996, historically white colleges and universities like UC Berkeley have aspired toward having diverse demographics, contending that it advances social and economic outcomes for society. Yet, these institutions have failed in varying degrees to ensure that many black folk have access and perhaps failed even greater at ensuring that those black people who do gain access are treated like full members of the university. This is not only true of black undergraduate students, but also graduate students, staff, and faculty. While universities contribute to and tolerate black suffering in higher education, black people have time and again risen to the occasion of making black lives matter, leading to a trend of black survival and innovation in the university despite the university, a trend that the university both relies on and readily takes for granted. This leads us to an event entitled Cot Caring, Unfreedom and the Costs of Service Labor in the University. This event emerges from and is dedicated to my hearing undergraduate students, like my friend Kendall Dowell, who while co-leading the, co the movement to repeal California's ban on affirmative action in 2020, spoke about how black students don't get to be students because they have to be advocates and ad activists. And they have to be activists because black lives are constantly under threat at places like UC Berkeley. What, research, what animates the research that I do and the talk that I've curated is to ensure not only that black people become free and are free, but that those helping us to become free get to be well along the way. So with that, I'm so excited to introduce you to two panelists and experts in their various fields who really helped me to think about these concepts and issues really well. First, Professor Adi Harvey Wingfield is the Mary Tellison Hemingway Professor of Arts and Sciences and Vice Dean for Faculty Development and Diversity at Washington University in St. Louis. Her research examines how and why racial and gender inequality persists in organizations and in professional occupations. Professor Wingfield has lectured internationally on her research in this area, and her work has been published in numerous peer-reviewed um, journals, including Annual Review of Sociology, Gender and Society, and American Sociological Review. She has served as president of both Sociologists for Women and Society and the Southern Sociological Society, and is an elected member of the Sociological Research Association. In addition to her academic scholarship, Professor Wingfield writes regularly for mainstream um, outlets in, um, such as Slate, The Atlantic, Vox, Harvard Business Review, 
and she is recipient of multiple awards, including the 2013 Richard A. Lester Award from Princeton University for her book, No More Invisible Man, Race and Gender in Men's Work. The 2018 Public, Public Understanding of Sociology Award from the American Sociological Association and the 2019 C. Wright Mills Award for the Society of so for the, from the Society for the Study of Social Problems for her most recent book, Flatlining, Race, Work, and Healthcare in the New Economy. I'm so excited to have Professor Wingfield here um, because as I was preparing um, in designing my dissertation study, I found it so helpful to see her model of studying the workplace experiences of racism for black, nurse, black doctors, nurses, and medical technicians, um, as well as their responses to it. That became a sort of um, a, an important frame of reference for me as I studied black undergraduate students, graduate student staff, and faculty. Um, Professor Wingfield's work also addresses the equity work that these people do and how um, black folk have to perform or end up get, getting caught up performing this labor um, because of the ways that organizations fail to prioritize equity in the first place. And that's her concept of racial outsourcing. I'm so excited for all of those contributions that you can bring to this talk today. I'd also, <laughs> go for it. We're also welcoming Bianca C. Williams, who used the she, her pronouns. Professor Williams is an associate professor of anthropology and the faculty lead of the Publics Lab at CUNY Graduate Center. She is an, eth an ethnographer of race, gender, and emotion in higher education and organizing communities with a focus on black women's effective lives. The investigative thread that binds Williams' organizing, teaching, and research is the question, how do black people develop strategies for enduring and resisting the effects of racism and sexism while attempting to maintain emotional wellness. She has written about black women, travel and happiness, radical honesty as feminist pedagogy, white supremacy, anti-blackness, and campus activism within the movement for black lives, and writing while anxious. Williams is the author of the award-winning book, The Pursuit of Happiness, Black Women, Diasporic Dreams, and the Politics of Emotional Transnationalism and co-editor of the volume, Plantation Politics and Campus Rebellions, Power, Diversity, and the Emancipatory Struggle in Higher Education. She's the 2018, she's sorry, 2016 AAA and Oxford University Press Award for Excellence in Undergraduate Teaching of Anthropology, and the Mellon ACLS Scholars and Society Fellowship Award in 2021. When I was, um, when I was starting my PhD in 2017, it was really hard for me to find scholars who were um, drawing on black studies and the analytics of black studies to critically examine the university in the contemporary period. And so I found it so helpful, uh, Professor Williams, that you were not only able to bring your work forward, um, but contribute to an edited volume and bringing other scholars together who take seriously black folks' vernacular of the plantation in order to understand and to name the ways that black folk experience dehumanization, unfreedom, social control, and exploitation today. And I so appreciate the expertise that you bring about the role of emotions and how we, under, how we experience, understand, and make sense of reality. Thank you for being here and for bringing those expertise into the room. I'm so excited for you to get to hear more from them about their work. And so I'd like to um, ask a question of our two panelists and I'll sit down. The first question opens with a preface, of course. <laughs> Higher education is at face value about education and healthcare about health. So why are these sites and the relatively few, the relatively privileged, also few, privileged black people within them important for understanding racism and anti-racism today? Um, I don't think you know this. So, so when I was thinking about coming here, thank you for everyone who's wearing a mask. I really appreciate it. I have a little one at home and this is my first time like in the world in a lot, like years, like paper two or three years. It's my first person in, in person thing. And when I was trying to consider whether or not I was going to fly all the way out here to Cali <laughs> from Newark, um, I was thinking about what my new role in all of this higher ed work is post during the pandemic and um, and now as a mom, my first time mother. And what you don't know is that the first time I remember seeing a baby in a higher ed academic space that was intellectual space was when you brought your first one to a talk at Duke. And I remember I was sitting on the floor. I don't even remember who was talking. I remember it was a crowded room. I remember we were all in there and you had your baby on your back. And I was like, we can do that. 
we can bring children to this space and do this work. And as I think about higher ed and why we, I do the work here and the cost of that work, right? Opening my child up to whatever may be in this room and why I would choose to do that, right? It's because I know that as a black feminist, this is my space to do the organizing. I understand that higher ed is a space of warfare and war, that we are at war right now. Um, We've been for a long time, but we are at war right now that this space is exploitative and extractive and there are an intentional reasons why white supremacists fight the way that they do in, in this space. So for me as a black feminist, as someone who's trained in black studies, as someone who does the, uh, it brings, um, works through um, the work of black anthropology, um, it's because I believe that the collaboration that black people have in this space, the uh, the, the ability to um, redistribute, sorry, my brain, redistribute resources that we are gaining access to in these privileged spaces across class to communities that surround these institutions, that stuff is important. Um, that's why higher ed is an important space. I don't want to exceptionalize higher ed. I don't want to say that it is um, drastically different than the other industries that, that we're in, but I do think that it's clear that the right and white supremacists understand the power of this space, and we should too, as black people who gain access to it. So I'll also um, echo the, the thanks for the invitation. It's really exciting to be here and have the opportunity to speak with everyone. I think the premise of this question is pretty interesting in terms of why these are sites where relatively privileged black people's experiences are worthy of study. Um, because I don't know that I think that the relative privilege of black people in these spaces really, really matters that much. I think that we know that the social institutions where black people are present pretty consistently are ones where black people are disadvantaged because that is by design the nature of how structural inequality in America works. So whether we are talking about education, healthcare, schools, government, correctional facilities, whichever institution we're talking about, we're going to find structures and spaces that are uh, disproportionately adversely affecting black people. What I do think shows up from education and healthcare to echo, uh, I think Bianca's really insightful remarks about why those are uniquely targeted spaces is that they are also spaces where resources can potentially be scarce, but they are also spaces that have pivotal power for change, particularly if we were talking about higher education. And I think healthcare as well. It's a contested site because of the resources that are allocated there, but it's also a contested site because it's just so fundamental to how we live our lives and our well being and our ability to. Um, be healthy, functional, functional people. One of the things that I've learned from my own research on black healthcare workers is that for them, that experience of health and how personal and fundamental it is really had a pronounced impact on the way that they saw their work and the ability to do what they saw as their work effectively because they were so directly confronted by the way that black people in the healthcare system as patients were adversely affected by medical racism, by their college, by often ostensibly well-meaning colleagues' mistreatment of patients that reminded them of family members, of themselves, of people that they knew from their neighborhoods uh, growing up and that they had been involved with and that they really, really related to in, in very personal ways. So healthcare is a useful site in my view, for thinking about these questions of race and racial inequality because it is so personal and because it highlights the ways that black workers who are underrepresented in those spaces really navigate with ways that work isn't uh, kind of this dispassionate, distanced, severance style <laughs> thing for many of us. It's often very personal. And seeing the ways that black people are disproportionately affected in healthcare like they are in so many other structures can make it really difficult to do the work of the, to, to do the work of the job in ways that have an impact on what types of work gets done. And I think that's why we see the equity work that I describe in flatlining happening for black professional workers of trying to make these organizational spaces ones that are more equitable and ones that are more fair and ones that aren't quite literally costing black people their lives. Thank you for situating yeah, higher education, universities, and healthcare um, as places that matter for black folk living long lives, healthy lives. But for me, um, Professor Williams reminds me of the conversation that um, Professor Rayford opened with, right? That what happens in universities might shape what our kids get to read, for example, 
um, not not only wh where we can bring our, our, our loved ones, but also right access to certain curriculum or getting to see ourselves, getting to, um, yeah, speak freely about our truth and our history and know who we are. There's there's so many things that I've been thinking about with your remarks. Um, hmm. And yeah, it's like these places are can cause so much harm. So those are places that we need to be to to disrupt that um, and to use it for other means, like red, the redistribution of resources, like you were saying. I want to I want to move on to another question, and um, I'll put it on the board after I ask it. It's, what does studying racialized gender entail conceptually and methodologically? These are two scholars who do phenomenal work um, about black women, um, their scholarship about black men and masculinity. And I just want, yeah, to hear from you, what does one study when studying racialized gender? That's a great question as well. Um, for me, studying racialized gender means thinking about ways that, it, it, this is going to sound a little cliche and kind of predictable, but it, it means literally doing what I think um, previous scholars like Kimberly Crenshaw and Patricia Hill Collins have really pushed for um, in their uh, iterations of intersectional, intersectionality theory and intersectional work. To me, it means thinking really critically about how those categories overlap and what that overlap means for the outcomes that we are looking at. For me, it's meant what those outcomes look like in uh, trying to understand various black workers' experiences in settings where they are underrepresented. So you mentioned in the biography of my previous book, No More Invisible Man, which focuses on black professional men working in white male-dominated occupations. And part of why I wanted to write that book was that I was really struck by looking at a lot of the sociological literature that focused on uh, black men and finding that it all really grounded them and situated them in urban underclass areas, right? There's a lot of research that's not hard to find that talks about black men in urban areas and how they're being underserved by school systems, by the labor markets, by the criminal justice system. But that's not a comprehensive picture of black men or black masculinity. There are also black men who aren't underserved by these, or I shouldn't say that. There are black men who aren't in these urban environments who are in professional white collar jobs, but are still facing challenges by virtue of the intersections of race and gender. And there really wasn't a lot of literature or scholarship to try to think sociologically about how those intersections of race and gender impacted them. What did that mean for how they forged workplace relationships, for how they saw their positions in those occupations, for how they saw their opportunities for advancement or, or lack thereof? So to me, thinking about race and gender and racialized gender means thinking about what those intersections mean and how that can be a departure from what we might already know or expect to find in the existing research. And I think it also just means thinking more in a more complex fashion about race and gender as well, right? <clears throat> Excuse me. Thinking in a more complex fashion about race and gender. Um, I think part of what I was struck by in doing the research for No More Invisible Man was that the instinctive response that I often got from people when I told them that I did a lot of work on race and gender was to assume that I meant black women, which, you know, is certainly valuable and important research. But I also was motivated by thinking that there are a lot of ways that uh, heteronormative patriarchal society has really harmed black men that, again, reflect these intersections of race and gender in ways that go unnoticed if we are only talking about thinking about ways that uh, black men are underserved or, dis or adversely affected by criminal justice structures and schools and so forth. I think it's useful to think about how those intersecting factors and how black men are navigating gendered structures and the way that workplaces and other organizations are racialized and gendered spaces can give us some really important insights for how we can think about um, the, methodological and, uh, the methodological choices we make and the empirical findings that we come out with. And I think the last thing that I'll say about this is just that I always urge people when I talk about this publicly or my students, if we're going back to these questions of intersectionality, to make sure that we are being consistent and true with the original iterations of the theory and making sure that we're not just doing an analysis where we're uh, kind of focusing on the intersections without thinking about the structural dynamics and the power dynamics that they reveal, right? I mean, I, I just taught <laughs> Patricia Hill Collins to my undergraduate race class, and one of the things that I wanted to emphasize to them is that we don't want to lose sight of how a big part of her argument is that black feminist theory gives us insights for understanding power and who has it and who doesn't and what the dynamics are that create it and what the institutional structures are that build on it in ways that leave black women marginalized from many types of uh, institutional 
institutional structures, but also creating their own knowledge based on that exclusion. So it's a lot easier just to think about how intersections happen than it is to think about what those intersections tell us about structural power dynamics and what those mean and how they are created. But I think that's really a critically important part of the theory and a way that we really get a much more nuanced understanding of why it's useful to use an intersectional approach and what that can tell us, again, about racialized gender if we're thinking about the power dynamics that ensue as a result. Mm -hmm. Yes. <laughs> um, so my focus on black women um, and, and race and gender and racism and sexism um, comes from the anger and frustration of this in graduate school. Um, graduate school was really weird for me. I don't, I, I, it's, it's a hazing process. It's, it, I was really uncomfortable on first generation. I was like, where am I? And I, I went to school, I went to grad school at the same, in the same department I went to undergrad in. So I was like, what's happening? Um, and my frustration was not only that black women were missing from all the things we were reading. And I was like, you know, this black woman has already theorized this thing and has already practiced this thing, you know, generations ago. Like, why are we not reading these folks? Um, but it was that question of like, if you censor black women or if you censor folks um, who are marginalized, you get to see how the broader thing works. Like we understand how higher ed works in very clear ways that sometimes white folks don't understand because we enter this space differently, because it acts on our bodies differently, because we have to survive it differently. Um, and I was really frustrated that black women seem to be erased, pushed out, invisibilized, whatever the word was. Um, and that's why I ended up focusing on black women. I, I felt like if you could make the world better for black women, then everybody else would benefit from the ways that that um, power would have to change, that structures would have to change. Um, and so I ended up studying emotion because at the time that I was in graduate school, affect was like the new thing and everybody kept talking about it. And I was like, what is that? I don't understand what they're talking about. They kept trying to make me read Freud. And I was like, I don't want to do anything with that. Like, what is that? But I was clear from my training in black studies and from my training in feminism, that emotion, that narrative, that the ways that we try to articulate what is happening to us and what we are doing in the world were really important. And that whether it was feeling or affect or emotion or whatever word they wanted to label it as, that black women in particular, but black people understood the world and had an analytical and theoretical understanding of it through the ways that we experienced it. Through Sorry, I'm talking so fast, I'm sorry. Through the ways that we feel it experience it and live it. And I wanted to be able to document what that felt like. When we talk about plantation politics, you know, the, my co-editors are in education, um, trained in sociology and, and other disciplines. Um, and I, sometimes when I talk to them, they're like, feeling really emotion? But I wanted us to be clear about the ways that I could just go, mm, in a meeting. And the people that are black in the room know what I'm talking about. <laughs> because we're feeling something. We, we have a knowledge, that, that emotion, that visceral response, the why, why our guts are messed up, why we're dying earlier, why all these stresses on our bodies are having physical and emotional and psychological effects is because we are feeling and taking in what the world is doing to us. Um, but also in organizing spaces, that are not hopefully as toxic, because sometimes they are, we are also are feeling joy and happiness and contentment. And that imagining the future, that imagining how to change structures, how to um, deconstruct, destroy how power operates and, and imagine differently feels also that we have feelings when we're experiencing victory, right? Um, and so I wanted to kind of find a way to talk about that. and. Seemingly at the time, the only way I could do that was by centering black women. Something about black women and that race and gender intersection or that connection was the way to do it. Because when I centered other folks at the time, black, cis, hetero men that were at least written about in some spaces, I didn't get the same information. I couldn't get the same data. Um, and now, you know, we have expanded that understanding. We have, you know, a lot more understanding of gender and identities and sexualities. And, and I'm very grateful for that because I think that there's a lot more happening now in trans studies and in um, various forms of feminisms that we need to be pushed. That black feminisms in many ways has, central, has censored black cis st uh, straight women um, and we're being pushed in a lot of ways and we're learning so much more. I am so glad this is recorded. <laughs> One of the things that I'm really holding and that I'm excited that leads us into the next thing is um, 
a study of power and how we can study emotion, like we can be attentive to emotions to tell us something about power. Um, and it's just also really informative to interview black women in my experience, because folk are attuned to how they're experiencing the world and doing phenomenal, phenomenological interviews, interviews about sense making. Um, yeah, that's really helpful to better understand society, even methodologically in my experience. Um, but yeah, power and emotions. Um, I'm also excited to, as we continue talking, thinking about how um, class dynamics also shape things, thinking about your work, Professor Wingfield, and how um, for the case of right, high status folk among, among doctors, there's a much clearer gender dynamic or um, gender solidarity across racial groups. Um, but then with, for nurses, you end up finding that um, there's a lot more racial solidarity um, because of kind of where they're at in the organizational hierarchy. And I think that's going to be really interesting to think about as I read some of the quotes soon. Um, and then Professor Williams, I love that you were at the same place from undergrad to grad school, because I think that'll help us think about how being in one position or another in the institution shapes what sort of harm we might be exposed to and what we can do about it. Um, so with that, I want to share a little bit more about um, the dissertation study that I've been doing. And we'll be brief about this, because we just want to talk. Um, I want to talk with y'all, because y'all can hear from me later, and you will. <laughs> Let me mute this. All right. So. On the surface level, my dissertation is about anti-blackness and what black folk do about it, how black folk try to um, create possibility in life amidst that. Um, there's many issues that we can name when we think about anti-blackness, and there's many ways we can talk about the ways that black folk are responding to anti-blackness and performing equity work. For me, something that is really important to study is what happens when black folk contest anti-blackness? How do black, what do black folk experience? How does it feel, in one case, for the problem, black folk, to be solving problems in the university in a white space. Um, and so the problems of problem solving, and that's where, to me, I get at things like the costs of caring, um, the unrecognized and retaliated labor that folk um, perform, the appropriation of that labor, et cetera. In my dissertation, or really just being at Cal, I often heard black folks say, and especially students, I don't get to be a student. And on one level, we know that's because of how black students are treated in the classroom, let's say. That if, if um, being a student at Cal means that you get to fully participate in the classroom and you're recognized and you're called upon, that you're sought out for group work, and black students are denied that because they're not seen as fully human or fully, fully students, they're not seen as intelligible or valuable contributors, then they don't get to be a student if that's the student experience, right? So on one level, anti-blackness undermines the experience, black students getting to be students. Um, but on another level, black students, like Kendall talked about, not getting to be a student because they had to be an activist, because they had to perform labor, and in some ways, labor unbecoming of a student, labor of administrative labor, or organizing labor, or teaching labor, teaching professors, right, instead of getting to be the student themselves. So, I in, so in my work, I'm interested both in the anti-blackness that um, denies full membership in the, in the category of student, or staff, or faculty, but also the labor that ends up complicating people's performance of that normative duty or that normative, uh, that normative role. Over the three years that I was doing, that I was really trying to do data collection, now I'm, I'm really trying to write, um, I, I, asked, I did a survey and I asked um, black folk performing equity work, how strongly they agreed with a statement. Um, one of those statements was, I feel free to spend, um, I feel willing to spend more time performing equity work. Another statement was, I feel free to spend less time performing equity work. Uh, most felt willing to do more, but unfree to do less. And so this was really important to me to hold black folks' agencies and desires, but also black folks' sense of constraint. I also asked if it complicates their ability to perform, like their non-black peers, um, the amount of time. And that was also a, sen a site of contention, um, that black folks spend additional time doing, addi doing things, um, and sometimes that compli and sometimes, um, things that made it hard to also do their role. However, I want to know, it I use the word complicates and not uh, forecloses or denies, because black folks still outperform many of our peers. So let's get that straight, too. So it complicates, and it, that's a lot of extra labor. So with that, I want to do a close reading of some of the people who were speaking to me during the study. Um, often, social scientists will um, read and review what they learned um, in isolation, but in the spirit of the Black Studies Collaboratory. I want to do this collectively with our, with our panelists. Um, I chose 
a quote from a black graduate student, a black staff member, and um, a black faculty member to highlight some of the variation across groups, as well as the way that, those thing, that these status positions are interconnected and experiences of um, anti-blackness and trying to do something about it. And as we talk, I want us all to be thinking about the themes of care, freedom or unfreedom, and the costs of caring. All right, the first person is Roger. Um, I asked Roger if it ever felt exhausting um, to perform, as, to spend as much time doing equity work as he does. He says, yeah, it is exhausting because it's extra work that you have to do on top of the work that you're required to do. And you know, in conversations that I have with our black students, one student commented, I don't just get to be a black student. I have to be a black student and advocate for black students. White people can just be a white student. And I mean, the same goes for the black staff. I don't just get to be a black staff. I'm a black staff who also advocates for black staff and black students because I'm the person they feel comfortable coming to because we look like each other and they feel comfortable confiding in me because either one, have an idea and that I've experienced it or two, that I can help them navigate it. Because I'm not going to say, I'm not going to dismiss it and say, oh, you're just overreacting or oh, that's not a thing and that's not what they meant. I say, no, that's exactly what they meant and, that, and they were wrong for that and this is how you address it. Or you're not hearing things, you're not going crazy, your experience is valid. And when they go to other people, they try to explain it away because they don't understand what that experience looks like from that student of color. And so we spend more time advocating and pushing back on the institution to hear the student or rectify the wrong that that student experienced, whatever that may be. Whether it may be a faculty making a comment, a student making a comment, or just the lack of representation that that student feels where they don't have a community in their space and they struggle academically because of it. I think it depends on your energy level. Oh, I asked um, if it ever feels unsustainable. And Roger said, I think it depends on your energy level and on your position. Because as a staff, your boss can tell you, yeah, I think you need to spend more time doing something else. They can just find a reason to not have you around. I mean, Colin Kaepernick is a prime example of that. You're getting too up, you're getting too empowered, you're making too much noise, so we can just remove you. And now everybody else is afraid to, do, to say something because they don't want that to be their fate because they have a family to feed. Your boss gives you that conversation of, I think you're spending too much time, or as one of our staff told, was told, that's your extracurricular. No, it's not an extracurricular, it's part of my job. That diversity thing. No, it's not a diversity thing, it's, a campus, it's something that is a campus initiative. So when you minimize it, then you're not, it's not seen as important. They don't see value in it, because to them, they don't have to have these challenges they can just come to work and be white. All right, that is the first excerpt. That's from Black Staff Roger, and would love to um, hear from y'all what you read into this, given your own expertise. Um, and I'll also note, we'll probably spend the least time with this one, because as we talk, oh, as we hear the other quotes, I think it'll kind of layer on in a good way. Sure. Um, well, one, I feel for this person, because Ooh, yeah, um, the exhaustion is real and the frustration and um, sometimes resentment comes up because we shouldn't have to do this type of work, but we understand why we do it. Um, when we wrote the Plantation Politics book, the reason why, there were various reasons why we wanted to write it. We understood that we were not our ancestors, right? So we were not arguing that we were actually enslaved in these places, um, that definitely black people who are experiencing higher ed spaces now are in a drastically situ different situation. And we were clear that the exhaustion, that the anger, that the frustration, that the requirement that students, faculty, and staff feel to do some of this work, black students, staff, and faculty feel to do this work um, was essential to how higher ed works. Like higher ed doesn't work anymore without us doing this unfree labor. Um, that the, 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 the type of teaching and, and learning that students are doing in their predominantly white classrooms, that the teaching and learning that we were doing in our office hours were fundamental to how institutions like Berkeley or Duke or whatever could say that they were multicultural or welcoming or whatever. Um, and so I feel for this student because they're so right. Like it is required. The way that this whole thing is set up requires students to do this work. And when you don't do it, there is a various forms of psychological, emotional backlash. 
um, plantation politics, because the university is um, embedded in these plantation politics, because they are connected to the ways that our ancestors um, experience the land that these institutions were built on, that our ancestors were the capital that these institutions were able to exploit and extract to make these institutions. Because white folks who are in power, who are administrators, continue to look at us like we are enslaved, like the folks before us. This is why students experience the space in the way that they do. Um, and so part of acknowledging plantation politics, part of um, holding up the campus rebellions that students were organizing during the movement for black lives, the type of labor and time that they put in to changing their spaces, we wanted to honor that work because that, honor, that work is institution building work um, and it's work that universities want to repress and erase because they recognize that if those campus rebellions continue, then higher ed has to change and students were actually forcing them to do that. Um, but it's exhausting. So reading this quote, uh, my take on this was that this could have come directly out of flatlining, right? That, so I'll go back to the initial quote that you have where it starts. Yeah, it's exhausting because it's extra work that you have to do on top of the work that you're required to do. This is kind of the core of my argument about why racial outsourcing and equity work is a problem in healthcare institutions. Because essentially what organizations are doing in general today is that they are offering these statements that diversity is something that matters and that they want to be these racially diverse spaces and that that's valuable and it's important. What they often do not do commensurate with that is actually devote resources to making organizational spaces more diverse in ways that would actually shift numbers of black workers and workers of color throughout the organization. What they do instead is what I describe as this process of racial outsourcing, where they leave that work up to the few black workers who are in their employ and let them do the labor of making these organizational spaces more accessible and available to communities of color. And that can be through recruitment, it can be through retention, it can be through mentoring, it can be through trying to offset, again, uh, racially harmful processes that happen in the organizational spaces. And the staff member is experiencing exactly what I described from these healthcare workers, where he is doing this extra job on top of the job that he has already contracted to do. What I found in my work was that that has real adverse consequences across the board. It leaves black workers feeling alienated, it creates burnout, it creates disillusionment, it creates a sense of distance between themselves and the organizations where they are employed. It often creates more of a sense of distance between themselves and their coworkers. And again, it's a whole extra job that they're not being paid to do and that they're not getting compensation and recognition for, which is a big part of the problem. I think it's notable also, and you said we'll talk with the, we'll hear quotes from a student and a faculty member as well, but I just think it's notable also that this is coming from a staff member because the rest of what's in this quote that I think is really important is that their comments highlight their precarity in the organization in ways that I think are not necessarily going to be present for faculty if we were talking about faculty who are on the tenure track and ways that I think are not quite going to be present for students if they are uh, expecting to be at the university in a transitory space. So you've got the, <clears throat> excuse me, the statement from the staff member who says they can just find a reason not to have you around. I mean, Colin Kaepernick is a prime example of that. You're getting too up and you're getting too empowered. You're making too much much noise so we can just remove you. And now everybody else is afraid to say something because they don't want to be they don't want that to be their fate because they have a family to feed. And clearly this person is really highlighting where their position in the organizational structure leaves them able to empathize with what students are experiencing, able to offer some pathways for change and redress, but not necessarily able to engage in the type of sweeping whole scale organizational structure that would prevent these situations from being present in the first place, in part because of the precarity of their position as a staff member who presumably doesn't have tenure. I don't know if they're unionized here or what the status is of whether people are unionized or not, or even how uh, effective unions would be, but you get the point. They're not in a position where they necessarily have the um, institutional status to feel fully confident that making these types of sweeping changes is going to leave them in a position where they can feel certain about their employment status. And I think that has a lot to do with the choices that workers make in those situations and how you can find people in this paradoxical position where they feel compelled and they want to help and they want to be people who can help change these spaces so that others don't have to experience what they went through, but also feeling as though that that's a real tightrope to walk because doing so too effectively can have the 
unanticipated consequence of having real consequences for your own employment status and your own employment position. Can I just add one more thing to that? That healthcare and education in particular are spaces that attract people who are wanting to do that loving labor, who are wanting to change the world. Who So education is using that against us. In our, it, it is extracting this labor because we're thinking we're engaged in some type of like spiritual work or loving work or caring work or trying to change the world. And being aware of that, this is a capitalist <laughs> institution that is extracting labor through that, through that way. So the students are here to learn. We're, we're taught to think about education as like a neutral thing, when in actuality, it's not, it's political, it's capitalist, it's you know extractive. And so, um, yeah, I think it affects, like it, it attracts a particular type of person sometimes. Um, um, and it's used against us in that way. This labor of love, this spiritual work um, is exploitative. If we were w working at Walmart that we know is like a capitalist institution, we might have a different response to it, right? But we convince ourselves that we're doing spiritual loving work and then give up 60, 70, 80 hours of labor every week. Uh -huh. One thing, some of the things I'm taking from this, it's right, this is essential work. It's also some of the best work in the university. This is some of the best advising that's done. Hearing a student out, and for me, it's also wild to hear faculty talk of similarly about when I'm thinking like, oh, what's the equity work that they're doing? And it turns out they're listening to students. Listening to students is the equity some work sometimes. Sometimes it's a student movement, sometimes it's a movement, sometimes it's a committee, sometimes it's this or that, but sometimes it's literally listening. That black students aren't listened to is part of the problem. And sometimes listening, which is something that you think is so basic for pedagogy and for being a professor, for being a researcher, like how are you an interview and you, you don't listen to people or, right? Um, and yet that is the extra labor, but the, right, we can also think about the conditions in which the people are doing this extra thing you're supposed to maximize how many people you're advising. And you can't maximize if you're, if you're actually listening. So I know, you, I know your work also thinks, both your work thinks about the larger um, political economy, the larger moment of neoliberalism that we're in. And I think that's also so important to understanding this. But yeah, essential work that you have to do it. Um, and yet you're also constrained while doing it and not to worry about the consequences. And passion used against us, you know? That's the cot caring piece um, that I want us to hold. I'm gonna read a segment from a, fa a black faculty member. Not as much as I wanted to, but y'all just need to stay in touch with me and read the book one day. <laughs> okay. Jasmine, I had this experience with one of my undergraduate mentees that was in a way heartbreaking and also affirming. She told me a few months ago that she was talking with her mom about the ways that I've supported her. And so she was saying, mom, is this what it's like to be white? Because all I've known is white kids who have support, white kids who can talk to the professors after class, white kids who get opportunities, get on research projects, get feedback on their papers, get all this stuff. And I'm like, you're not getting this? I mean, it broke my heart. So every time it makes me want to go after whoever's being mean to her and not supporting her because she's brilliant and curious and excited and professional and all the things we want, right? And I'm sure there are so many other who have, uh, others who have that experience. I want to, as best as I can, contribute and make it so that they feel they are supported earlier, so they don't have to say or think something like that. What I will say, though, is that there are limits. I am one person. I am a parent. My children are first, always. And my health has suffered, I think, because of a lot of stress. I think that the stress is that I do, in a lot of ways, feel responsible. And I also know that my colleagues, a lot of my colleagues don't. And so I take it upon myself to make sure I'm there. And how it takes a toll, I'm neglecting so much. There have been times when I haven't felt well and had a doctor's appointment, but I still met with that student because I knew how hard it was for them to get on my calendar. I miss meals sometimes. Um, I'm up at night thinking about stuff, taking notes on how to help them, so I'm neglecting my sleep. And again, I'm doing it myself. No one's asking me to do this. It's me making these conscious decisions. And so I'm well aware. Yeah. Jasmine also thinks about some of the black women at Cal who've, who've um, died prematurely. Um, and she doesn't want to be a victim of the institution's neglect or violence. 
She knows she's taking on more than other faculty members. It's not only how many qu committees she's on, but the kinds of committees and why they're interested in her expertise or why they're interested in her. That sometimes it's not her expertise, but just that they want someone um, who has good pedagogy and how she is. They want a supportive body in the room. I'm looking at the last paragraph. And I shouldn't say yes, but in a lot of cases, it's a black student and I'm the only black person on the committee because their school doesn't have anybody to support them. They don't have faculty members who understand what they're doing or support their projects. And so then they pull me in to basically show them the way. And then in a lot of cases, some of the faculty in those schools lean on me and are like, well, you seem to know a lot more about this area. It's like, I am outside the field. Like, you all need to get it together. I can't lead this dissertation, and I won't. So this also reminds me a lot of the findings from uh, flatlining, where a lot of the black doctors uh, and nurses that I talked with described, again, very similar processes here of doing this equity work. And there are a couple of things that I want to pull out for uh, further emphasis. One is in the beginning part of the quote, where the respondent talks about um, kind of taking some responsibility. And I want to say that with a bit of an asterisk. But the respondent is saying, you know, I'm taking it on myself to make sure that I'm there. Uh, I'm not required to do this, but I'm doing it because I feel like this is something that's important and something valuable. I think that's an interesting aspect of this equity work uh, to the extent that many black workers I have found in these types of spaces where they are underrepresented genuinely do want to be people who, to some degree, are doing things like this. They want to be people who can help others who they see experiencing these challenges, and they want to be people who can help make these spaces better and less hostile and more welcoming and so forth. And in many cases, particularly for higher status black workers, it's not that organizations are singling them out and saying, you know, you have to do this. Now that does happen, I think, for lower status black workers. I found that for technicians, they did find that their managers directly uh, expected them and tasked them with doing additional work in ways that were not present for black nurses and black doctors. And I think that's a parallel to what's happening here. This professor doesn't describe her department chair kind of pushing her in this direction and saying that she should do more of this. This is stemming from her own uh, interest in and wanting to be kind of doing what you described, this uh, work of love and this work to make this organizational space a better place. But <laughs> I think it's also really important to tie that back to some of the points that she makes later in the quote. Uh, thank you. And the key one that I think stands out here uh, towards the end is where she emphasizes the school doesn't have anybody to support them. They don't have faculty members who understand what they're doing or support their projects. Why don't they have anyone who understands what they're doing? Mm -hmm. Why don't they have faculty who can support their projects? This is not her job, right? It is not her job as one individual black faculty member to make sure that the institution and that the organization is fully staffed in a way that can meet the needs of the students that the institution is admitting. That is the university's responsibility. Right? If we're talking about organizations, again, that say that they want to have more diversity and say that they want to attract a diverse body, part of your responsibility as a leader in that organization is to equip people who are coming into that space with the tools that they need to be, su to be successful. That is not being done if what you have is an individual faculty member who is trying to solve problems that are organizational and structural. One of the things that any sociologist and sociology professor will tell you is that individuals do not solve structural problems because they are structural problems, <laughs> right? I mean, that's just the way that it works. So I find it really noteworthy in here that this respondent is identifying this tension of wanting to be this person who um, is not responding to explicit external pressure and who is taking it again, to a degree upon herself to be available for these students to the point of missing meals and missing doctor's appointments and staying up at night and thinking about what these students need. But again, to me, that is a real indictment of and a reflection on the failure of organizational policy and organizational leadership, that an institution would allow any worker, particularly any underrepresented worker, to be in a position where their need to make things better and their interest in creating a better organization becomes exploited in such a way that this is the result, rather than the organization taking on the leadership role 
of actually hiring more faculty in these areas whose interests could be reflective of and meet the needs of the students that, again, that they say that they are interested in. And I put this in the framework of students and what the organization's responsibility is to students, but it doesn't stop there. It's a responsibility to faculty as well, right? Institutions, pretty much any university that you go to today, maybe with the exception of some in Florida, will say that they want more racial diversity. They'll say that that's important. I mean, it's true. <laughs> but they'll say that's important and we value this and we want diversity and we want to have diverse faculty, staff, students, blah, blah, blah. But again, you don't. If this is the outcome, you're failing at that mission. You're failing your students, you are failing your employees, you are failing at an organ as an organization at achieving what you are saying your goal is because you are not providing the employees in your space with the resources that they need, you are not providing the students in your space with the supports that they need in order to succeed. And you cannot, in 2023, claim that you want to be an organization that values diversity if you are not actually valuing diversity by instituting the resources that people need if they're going to be part of a diverse community. And let's talk about the words that are used to do these things. To late, so, so we're not required to do this work in theory, but when they hire us, they are expecting us to do this work. I mean, you know, when they hire the one black professor in the literature department, they assume that that one black professor is going to diversify and make equitable the entire thing, right? So we are expected to do a particular type of work. And then the work that we're expected to do that this faculty member is talking about is not the work that is promoting us or that is quantified for our promotions, right? And so in my world, that sounds like, Professor Williams is amazing at methodology. She can train us in method. She teaches us to ask good questions, how to write, how to read, how to engage in communities in ways that are equitable and responsible. But I don't know what her theoretical project is. I don't know what her analytical project is. I don't understand, really, I understand how black feminism is praxis. I don't understand the intellectual project of black feminisms, right? And so there's this weird thing where no one understands that the intellectual and analytical work that we do actually infuses the way that we do our training of our students, that we lead and build institutions, that that work is work, that it's labor, and it's not touchy, feely, fuzzy, out of no, like, it takes expertise. It takes time and energy to learn how to teach and do pedagogy. Pedagogy is not something you just wake up one day and do. But these things are not valued as real labor. Um, these things are not valued as things that actually make institutions like this work. They're just additional things that people feel like we just do. And it's in our nature, especially if you're a woman, right? Um, so a lot of the things that this person is talking about is real work and should be valued as that because it is essential to making students go out in the world and do something with their lives. But it's not seen as that. And the one other thing I'll just say is um, my co-editor, Frank Tewitt, one of my co-editors, was a, a chief executive diversity officer when we were doing the plantation politics book. Um, and <laughs> he looked at me one day, he was like, we're gonna write a book about plantation politics. And I was like, I'm not writing that book. Um, not because I was scared, but I had I had a lot of feelings about the word plantation. Like I was just like, I just don't know how I feel about this. Um, and his chapter is on chief executive diversity officers being the current version of the slave driver on the plantation. And for him, when we were, yeah, when we were going through the Movement for Black Lives era, where I was the co-founder of the um, Denver chapter BLM, and he was at another university doing this work, and Dean, our other editor, was uh, a person of color who's not black, who was trying to figure out his space in this movement. We were all coming together trying to talk about what was happening in that moment. And for Frank, he was like, I'm the chief executive diversity officer at the University of Denver, and I'm being asked to repress campus rebellions that I started when I was an undergrad that I am being forced to turn against myself 
in order to repress these students so this institution can continue to do the white supremacist things and anti-black things it does. And this is the type of work that not only faculty and staff are dealing with with students, that being forced to die unto yourself in order to do the project of education, that is what we're being asked. And this is why it feels this way. Because we, our bodies, our emotions, our spirits, our minds know it's not right. That's why we feel this way. Sometimes you don't even need the mm -hmm to know what the, it's about, you know? Um, wow. Responsibility, but in light of structure. Understaffing, other people not being trained or having expertise. Um, and for me, I always think about the alternative. Like, if, I, if, if that person doesn't do it, what happens? Um, for faculty, I often hear them talking about how that would mean their colleague would be the one on that committee, and they don't want that colleague on that committee. Not only because that of how what that faculty know. <laughs> not only not only because of what the, how the faculty treats other students, but how that faculty member treats other black professors, which I think is one interesting difference, perhaps, with your book, where black doctors don't really deal with as much interpersonal racism as the nurses and professors deal with a lot of shit. Okay. Um, the alternative also sometimes is financial aid. If this student doesn't get seen and supported and get that paper done, are they going to be ineligible for their financial aid? Is that going to affect their, their cost of living and whether or not they can continue, period, right? That it's bigger than the courses, too. Um, so the alternative, I think, also weighs heavily. Um, and for me, that's why I think about a lot about coercion, right? That um, one, I think, Evelyn in Evelyn O'Connell Glenn's book, Forced to Care, she talks about um, coercion as when you have to perform disagreeable labor because the alternative is worse, is deemed worse. I also think about, right, in the case of care, that you might be performing agreeable labor but under disagreeable conditions. Because black folk want to care for one another, right? There's that sense of purpose. But if I don't do that, the consequence, that's what I think people are feeling compelled by, that they want to mitigate an alternative that um, we know would cause more harm sometimes than um, what people are already going through. There's so much here. There's so much here. And I want to briefly get um, bringing a graduate student voice into the room. So we'll do that. And then um, I'll also paraphrase some paraphrase because I love hearing t from our black community at Cal more than we have time for at the moment. Speaking to this issue of uh, requirement, freedom, um, Gloria says, I don't think it's by choice. Oh, she was mentioning that the, um, during the pandemic, it was like an opportunity to self-evaluate. Am I spending my life the way that I want to because life for black folk is not guaranteed and can be shortened, um, and it often is shortened. So, and I asked, after, given that you got to self-evaluate, like why do you think people continue to perform, like engage in equity work and activism? She says, I don't think it's by choice. I think the average person given the choice and the option would just like, I don't want my life to be about this. I wanna get out of this and you know, get out of my body and just be this normal person that doesn't have to worry about this. I think too many times you are so impacted by the issues that you have no choice but to get into advocacy if you want to have some sort of control over your life, right? I think there's just a small fraction of people who are just so passionate about advocacy. But I'm being affected every day by these issues. And it bothers me so much that I need to make the change. So, you know, I think it's less of a choice thing, but more of like, there's no other way type thing. There's no other way to numb it out and act like it's not happening because it's impacting you at multiple levels of your experience. And sometimes it's like you want to stop, where it's no longer passion. It's like you want to stop, but you feel guilty. And you feel like if you stop or you take a break, things are not going to get done. And people are going to feel the impact, as opposed to a passion that was like, oh, this is good. I'm so absorbed by this. And in those cases, you take a break. And you're like, mm, maybe I'm going to switch from yoga to Pilates for a month and not feel like you betrayed the whole cause of yoga or whatever. <laughs> this is why I love interviewing black folk. Come on. Come on. I feel like there is some passion and some desire to do it, but I also think there's this weight of responsibility. There's some additional weight to it that we all feel or have felt at some point. This is where, where it's like, yeah, you can't always disconnect when you want to. 
to paraphrase the rest, um, Gloria talks about how as soon as she meets black um, women who are younger in their PhD than her, she immediately tells them to just say no, whatever it is, because she wishes that she had people to, um, to, to help her step back, to, to let her know it's okay to say no, to not always be championing every issue. Um, she notes that it's, it's racial, but it's also gendered. Um, so I want to bring that into the conversation. She was talking to a few of her black male friends, and um, they, dealt, they felt the same pressure and the same responsibility to, to do something, or similar pressure, she thinks, um, but they didn't feel as, comp but they felt had an easier time saying no. So I want to talk about pressure and how people respond to that pressure, and some of the different, I, I, yeah, I think there's, there's different pressures too. Um, and then she talks about how much time you end up spending. If you're on, um, yeah, if you end up on XYZ committees and working like 20 hours a week on non-related stuff, um, yeah, if you don't take an extreme stance, you're gonna end up on too many committees spending too much time on non-related stuff. Or maybe it's related and you're passionate, but it's drawing too much from you. So no matter how much you care, if you're on five committees and you have two hour meetings every week, I mean, at the end of the week, you're going to be tired. By the end of that semester, you probably don't want to hear about any of those things anymore. And if you're so passionate and you can keep it going for a few years, really after some point, you're going to get really burnt out. Um, so my first book is about a group of black women, um, most of them over 40, who go to Jamaica regularly because they feel like that is a free space for them. Um, these are African-American women. Um, and when I wanted to do my research on them, everybody was like, oh, you want to study Stella's? And I was like, I think it's a little bit more complex than that. Um, and what I learned from, so happiness actually came from them. I didn't know I was going into the field studying happiness, but they, they like it kept showing up. And it came from this feeling, this feeling that they weren't activists, they weren't organizers, they were, you know, regular black women who some had families and they worked and most of them um, middle class or lower middle class. And just living in this country as a black woman exhausted them. And so they were like, you know, I'm going to go to Jamaica where it's a predominantly black country. I'm, ass I'm assuming that those folks are just like me. I'm gonna go on vacation. And so that was their way of like replenishing themselves, right? Now there was a lot of issues, all the privilege, all the things, right? But the project was trying to understand why these women kept going to this place and what it had to do with their life at, in the US and that being around other black people in a space where the white gaze was not as present meant that they could have some place to just live and breathe, right? Even though they were also repressing Jamaicans in a lot of problematic ways, right? So this, this, this experience reminds me of that because it reminds me that black folks, a lot of black folks, not all black folks, con constantly are looking for space to just be, to just be. Um, and I don't know about the word normal because I don't know what that means, but just be black in whatever way they want to be or just be human in whatever they, way they want to be. Um, and higher ed usually makes that really difficult. Um, the other thing, you, you're talking about gender. Um, and I talk about this with my friends all the time, the ways that, um, again, black women are expected to do a particular type of work in higher ed. Um, and that's oftentimes because the things that I had just named before in my previous remark that become gendered as feminine, pedagogy, mentoring, um, we don't say leadership, we say service. Um, those things are gendered as feminine. And so when black men do it, they're seen as like, an amazing unicorn. Oh my gosh, they can teach. Let me pay them $20,000 so they can go somewhere else and talk about teaching instead of doing the teaching, right? So like suddenly they become like this like master at doing the things that people assume that like, like black folks couldn't do. But the women who are doing the work are in the trenches doing the work, right? And not getting credit for it. Um, so there's a lot of really interesting ways that gender operates, um, you know, for cisgender folks, but also like trans and folks like who are trans folks and folks who are non-binary. Like, it's interesting how the spectrum works and how patriarchy and heterosexism uh, influences what work is valued and how it's seen and interpreted. Um, and again, those soft things that are important—the mentoring, the teaching, the training—get gendered as feminine. 
Yeah, I had a, a again a couple responses to specific points in this uh, transcript. I guess the overall overarching thing, you know, I don't want to be that person who comes from a different university and then is very critical of the kind university that invited me here. But again, I mean, this really does look to me like another case of institutional failure. That there are graduate students. <laughs> <laughs> All right, this is me. I know it's being recorded, so I'm taking a, a bit of a risk here. But just again, there just there should not be a university where graduate students are in this position. That's that's really kind of unacceptable, right? I mean, just to see the student uh, when I when you got, when I got to the first part in this quote where the student talks about advising other black women to say no because you're going to say yes to more things. And I thought, yes, that's great advice. That is the advice that I give to graduate students. And then got a little bit further and see her mentioning being on XYZ committees, working 20 hours a week on non-related stuff. You shouldn't be on any committees. You should be focusing on your coursework, your dissertation, getting out, getting a job. That's it. Because other people should be the ones who are doing all of that other stuff so that you don't have to, so that you don't have to think about it. And again, an institutional space that, once again, says that it values and prioritizes diversity, but then leaves it to vulnerable people in the organizational structure to be on committees that presumably are about making the organization more accessible in some way or other, that is not an institutional space that is serving its students. That is not an institutional space that is serving its faculty. That is not an institutional space that is doing what it says it wants to do or what it is supposed to be doing if the aim and objective is really to have more diversity. And to anybody who's in the audience and thinking of uh, going to graduate school or is a graduate student, <laughs> take this advice that she gives herself early on. Do not join these committees. Do not be on these 20-hour uh, work week things. Don't do any of that stuff. Say no to all of it, all of it. Don't do any of it because that's not what you should be doing at this point in your career. So I very strongly want to make that point because this shouldn't be happening for, for this student. Uh, the only other thing that I think I want to note, again, it goes back to some of the things that you asked us to consider before about uh, the emotional aspect of it. And I know that that's more of some of the work that you've been doing also, but it stuck out to me earlier in the quote, sometimes you want to stop when it's no longer passion. It's like you want to stop, but you feel guilty and you feel like if you stop or if you take a break, things are not going to get done and people are going to feel the impact. I think it goes back to, again, your points about higher ed in particular being an example of a space where the work is very much a labor of love and people are drawn to it because they want to have an impact and they want to make a difference and they want to make these spaces better. But we're also seeing the emotional toll of what happens when organizations do not have structures in place to really create the diversity that they say that they want. People end up doing work that they don't always feel passionate about, but they feel compelled to do and they feel as if they have to do. But these consequences are what I was describing earlier, the burnout, the exhaustion, the alienation, the weariness, the toll that it takes on the body and the spirit and the self, I think all of these are present in what this respondent is, is telling you. And she even ends, the, or even the quote that you give us even ends with her making this comment that after some time you're going to get very burnt out, right? So this makes me think also about how we, in some ways I think, have a bit of a mismatch about our understanding. So th there is some sociological research on sociology of emotions, and some of it makes this argument that organizations, particularly modern ones in the service industry, will be very prescriptive about the types of emotional responses they expect to see from workers, and that that becomes an area where uh, organizations enact ever more control and engage in this process of actually distancing people from their emotions because they become subject to emotional control. Again, particularly in the service industry, when there's a sense that organizations can mandate good service and that people have to make themselves feel cheerful or make other people feel cared for or uh, feel deferred to or what have you. I think what this response highlights is one of the ways that, again, I think a racial analysis was really missing from a lot of that literature on emotions and organizations because what we're not seeing here is the organization telling the student how she should feel. What we are seeing is a natural response to the student trying to make up for the organizational shortcomings and for those emotions of feeling burned out and feeling exploited and feeling exhausted and feeling tired and feeling guilty about not being able to do more, 
those are emotional responses that aren't coming from what the organization is telling her, but it's coming from the organization's failures, right? And that's not, I think, given the attention that it deserves and a lot of the sociology of emotions research, but it does offer a way to think more comprehensively again about how emotions matter and what they can tell us and what they highlight about the ways that organizations are structured and how when organizations really fall short in their attempts to and efforts to create more diversity, there are, there are emotional consequences that pretend physical ones. But those are going to get overlooked if we focus on the existing models of expecting to see how organizations are driving those feelings. Sometimes it is the absence of organizational work that drives those emotions, but that doesn't mean that those emotions are missing or invalid. They're still present. They're just not being driven by the organization directly. They're being driven by the organization's failures. Mm -hmm. um, again, what we were saying earlier, right? Um, paying attention to emotions as a, as a way to trace and map out what, what is going on, like what's systematically going on, what's, a, what's going on with power here. And it could be the power is a move of, as employee, you need to, this is what you're expected to feel, or this is what you need to feel and express, these are the feelings you need to express. And other times, it's the power is we do nothing and we expect you to do something about it. Um, so that's really, really important. What's interesting too, as I was um, talking to folk, is that um, there are diff I feel like there's different instances of where people are expected to care. Um, if you're a black person, you're generally expected to care about black people. Like that's pe black folk have that expe expectation of other black people. Like, why, why don't you care about black people? Um, if you are a black woman, you're expected to care. Um, if you are the only one, you're expected to care. I think that happens sometimes where, um, and so black men may experience like, oh, I'm the only one here. Like, I should do something. I have to do something. Or the black faculty member who's like, well, there's no one else here. And so there's, right, there's those kind of dynamics. Also, if you have expertise in the area and like that involves black people, it's like, well, you study black people. And if you study black people, ideally, you also care about black people. But there's these additional pressures and expectations that we would hope, we would hope. We still hope. Um, yeah, and I think what's interesting too is right. We have in the case, in this case, students doing the extra labor, and I don't, I don't think that there's like a necessary, like a clear corollary in in the case of your project, right? Where it's like patients, like hospital patients, are not doing this work necessarily. Like you might have a family member advocating for, but they're not a member of the organization in the way that a student is. And I, we could think of. Yeah, I feel like it's tempting to think of students as consumers, but I don't want to opt too much into that kind of neoliberal, neoliberal framework as education as something that we consume. So I want to resist that, but I do think it's important to note that students are in a different kind of organizational position, but are still members of the organization. Um, but the, or, the, it's not an occupational, the student is not an occupation necessarily in the same way that being a university. But for graduate students, it's like, I mean, what are we? And we're everything and nothing. And like we're relied on exploited, but we're also like getting internship experience. Like, you know, there's a lot of stuff. It's complicated. Please. So um I was listening to so I was a student who, if you had said say no to everything, I listened to you and be like, I say no to everything, but I'm gonna do it anyway because I'm passionate about it. Like that was I was that graduate student, which is why I'm burnt out now. <laughs> so I just wanna say to that student who's in the room who's like, I'm probably gonna do it anyway because no one else is here or because I care or whatever. My problem isn't always necessarily the work, it's how it is devalued and not counted. Yeah. So for me, I was always in meetings and organizing stuff more than I was in class at Duke. I just was, like I was at the BSA instead of going to class. I did, but this was my thing. My thing was I understood Duke inside and out. I know how that institution works. I know, like, I have a long-term view and analysis of higher ed through my undergrad and graduate student organizing. So if my t professors, who some of them did, lovingly black professors, who were like, she's implementing what I taught in the class. She took what I taught her, and she's doing it on this campus, so she deserves an A in this class. That's what I mean. If if you're gonna have campus rebellions and you're gonna have students being exploited and extracted from, then you should take what they're learning and applying and putting in practice and actually value it. That's the problem that I have because they're doing amazing work. They're going to take those skills and kick butt outside the institution, so value it. But what happens is that 
the institution sees a campus rebellion and is like, let's quiet it down, right? Let's, let's repress what's happening. But there's learning happening there. There's teaching happening there. Organizing is important. The relational stuff is happening, because believe me, <laughs> stuff is gonna go down <laughs> in the organizing space. And it's a collective feeling. So I understand why we're focusing on like individual feeling, but when students rebel on a campus, that is a collective feeling. That is rage, anger, frustration, some joy. So we can have an analysis of that collective emotion that's being erupted and um, performed and brought attention to that should tell you something about what is working or not at your institution. That is valuable knowledge. And it's learning, it's intellect, it's scholarly. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So we're already starting to think about freedom, and I want to I want to end the this moderated portion before we open up it up with Q and A on the topic of freedom, because um, we want Black folk to be free. Not only and and we can see Glory here. She it's not just that she wants these issues to be addressed, but she wants Black folk, these Black women coming up after her, to be free from doing this labor as well. So freedom from anti-Blackness and freedom from having to perform equity work, right? Um, so I want us to think about freedom. Um, given this pervasiveness of black folk having to deal with of white, historically white institutions, right? Because these institutions hold so much power and shape the life outcomes and experiences of black folk. Um, but also that black folk have to do something. So what, how do we imagine, what comes to mind when you think about freedom in this context? Yeah, I, I get, Two decades post PhD, it's hard for me not to think um, about this from a sociological <laughs> perspective. Um, but I, I, I guess I think in this context about freedom, meaning not being socially and institutionally constrained by virtue of the types of characteristics that we've been talking about, right? So things like race, gender, or more broadly, uh, sexual identity, nationality, citizenship, those things not imposing artificial constraints on opportunity, on access, on uh, ability to leverage and use resources, those things not being barriers in the ways that we know concretely that they are and that they continue to be, to be barriers. In terms of what it would take to actually get there, one of the kind of most ironic and frustrating things about studying uh, the research on racial inequality in workplaces is that there's actually a pretty decent amount of data on what actually works, right? It's not really a mystery at this point anymore. There's uh, actually a recent book that really comprehensively analyzes uh, based on about I'd say several decades of data with different companies, with HR managers, with leaders. It's called Getting to Diversity by Frank Dobbin and Sandra Caleb. And what they do is actually document evidence-based strategies that have been known to work and known to create more diversity in private sector organizations and in workplaces. Some of the strategies involve uh, changing ways that organizations engage in recruitment and hiring, uh, implementing mentoring programs that are formalized, uh, obviously empowering and offering resources to people who are in diversity management, instituting diversity task forces. Uh, it may not surprise people that they do not recommend diversity training because we also know that there is enormous evidence that mandated diversity trainings do not work and they do the opposite of what they say they're going to despite them consistently being in use in many companies. So we know what it would take, at least when we're talking about race and gender, to reduce some of these systemic barriers. Um, many companies don't take those steps. They don't do these things. And we can have a non-recorded discussion about why that might be the case. <laughs> but there are, there are solutions out there, and there are things that organizations can do so that the types of responses that are coming up in your interviews don't have to be so normative and so expected and so commonplace among people in universities and the organizations that I study in healthcare and in other, in other spaces. In terms of what it would actually feel, it's hard for me to know what that actually would be like because of a professional career and a life spent under those constraints, right? So it's hard to know exactly uh, what that manifests as when those uh, structural barriers aren't there. I think all I can say, though, is that 
there's a path towards removing them. I think it's less of a question of how and more of a question of will, interest, and commitment at this point. I wish we um, had more time and space to imagine what freedom would feel and look like. That, that To me, that's, that's the request. Give us the money and the time so we can imagine what that would look like. Um, for me, uh, something happened after January 6th. Like, again, I was in, you know, doing organizing work with the Movement for Black Lives for a while, um, doing, watching what was happening on January 6th and watching just the audacity of white supremacy and white national, nationalism on global, like, television. Something in me just, like, broke. <laughs> and the kind of, you know, diversity work I used to do before, the kind of training and teaching, and I taught in Colorado, so white folks, like that's it. There's no black folks in Colorado. Um, and that was my, I chose that. That was my, like, I mean, the job market, but also like I chose, I was clear when I went to Colorado that my organizing and activism was gonna be teaching white kids black studies. And that was, I was okay with doing that work for a long time. Um, and then January 6th happened and it was like everything that I had been doing in the movement was like, we need to reassess because this is clearly, well, this is another thing that's happening here, right? So freedom for me since January 6th has looked like being very clear that I no longer will talk, do work, teach, any of that stuff if it's not dedicated to being a predominantly black space that is black centered. I don't do that work anymore. I'm not doing it. White folks gotta do it. They got, or, or folks who are like, People of color or black folks who are new who are, still have excitement about it, they could do it. But I'm not there anymore. Um, so for me, being a black feminist professor and anthropologist in this moment has looked like me waking up every week as I make my plan of what I'm doing that week. How are black people centered? How is this helping us get to a better future? How, are, how is this helping break down some of the constraints and the structural barriers that we're having? How can I gain access to resources to make sure that other folks who are alongside me and who come behind me have more space to do the work that they wanna do? How can I break down some of these disciplinary barriers that force us to like, you're a sociologist and you're an anthropologist. We got questions that need answers and we should be able to use every theoretical and analytical tool possible that we have access to, to answer those questions. So how do I train my students to understand that they should have access to multiple canons and multiple tools and be get their degrees and get jobs wherever they want to get jobs inside higher ed or not as thinking people who are smart and brilliant and can help solve some of these problems and answer some of these questions. That's for me in this moment, that's what freedom looks like. I'm sticking with the not constrained by positionality, infrastructure, um, right? The material conditions, right? That we, that <laughs> you have an article, right? Where from one of your talks, uh, a presidential lecture about like black women reclaiming time. And it's like, we already have the blueprint. Like Crenshaw Collins told us like, there is a material analysis that is necessary and let's implement it. Um, yeah. I and mean, I do think about that as, as a complicated thing at a place like Berkeley. Like, what is that really supposed to look like? Because there's the the division of equity and inclusion. There's the African American Student Resource Center. There's the Black Re There's the uh, Student Development Office for Black folk. There's this, that, and the other. Um, so there seems to be a Berkeley has a lot. I mean, that's a bureaucracy, right? We have so much infrastructure, and yet the needs are still outstanding. So, what kind of infrastructure is needed, right? Um, and yeah, definitely we need time and resources to dream. So again, I'm thankful for the Black Studies Collaboratory for giving some of those conditions to us and using philanthropic money and university resources to make sure that we have some, some space to dream and to imagine this. Um, and I'm, yeah, there's something about refusal too, refusing labor. Um, I, yeah, some staff were talking about how they're, um, they feel like it's important to sometimes let, say no to the labor, recognizing that it might um, in the short term, cause some suffering, or or it might not. Some suffering might not be mitigated because we withhold our labor, um, 
but we might survive in the process and the institution's failures might be become more evident, but because we're so often covering for the university's failures, it's unclear how bad the institution is failing. Um, and so sometimes maybe we need to let the institution fail um, so that we can, so that it can be clear w the work that needs to be done. Let the discipline fail, let the professional organization fail, mm -hmm. let all those things fail. Yeah. So there's some refusal of labor and letting, perhaps letting things fail so that we can uh, work. So the problem is, is, is as evident as we feel it in our bodies. I really want to hear from some of our audience um, about what questions and are resonating with y'all. Oh, we're going to run you a mic. <laughs> and we're going to, yeah, I would love to get like two, three questions. So we'll try to keep, actually, yeah, let's, um, Jared, we'll have you ask a question. Um, who else wants to, okay. I'm going to get someone way in the back. <sighs> Ari. Um, and then one more. <sighs> yeah, okay, sorry. Yeah, purple or maroon. Alina, hey, it's good to see you. Sorry, distance. Um, yeah, let's run that. Okay, cool. Um, first of all, this is amazing. I'm having a lot of trouble containing myself. I just want to say thank you so much to all of our panelists and to our like organizers and everyone. That's just so good. Um, but uh, Professor Williams, something that you were saying, or two things that you said that seemed related to me about your work on affect and then about method where you, you gave that kind of, what to me is like the first time I felt seen in a while, where it was sort of like all this stuff that I do in the classroom is like that method is the work. You know what I mean? I feel like as a student, I've run up against the problem of like being disciplined or being made to use methods that obviously don't work or that have long histories of failure. And so what I guess I'm interested to ask this panel is in part about you know, a broad question about the relationship between structural racism and disciplinarity, right? about how like being disciplined, I'm from the English department, um, in an English department actually means being kind of like, you know, aggressed against in some, in some way. Um, but I also kind of, uh, yeah, wanted to ask about kind of like why, if you guys have any thoughts on why it feels like there's such an allergy to using like open print, black, um, methods to work, to do like black work within the university. It's like, why are you not allowed to use a black method to do black work or a black method to do any work or a method to do any work? Like, why is it that everything, like, are those things related, that like structural racism problem and the disciplinary problem? And like, why is, what do you guys think of that? Do you experience that allergy between like, what, like as soon as you present a project that works in a way that has a history, but that history happens to be black, it's like, actually, no, 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 you need to do this thing. Um, or you'll never get anything. You can't leave here, you won't get a job, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, I feel like a lot of graduate students probably run into that for time. So I'm just curious what you guys think. Thank you. We, yeah, we'll note that and wanna ask, we wanna let the two other folks speak and then um, we will welcome y'all to do whatever narrative arc works uh, for you. If, if there's a way to connect the dots, fantastic, if not, we're going to walk outside and uh, mingle um, before we get kicked out. So, yes, Alina. Hi. Um, well, I'm loud. <laughs> um, my name is Alina. I just got my undergrad degree at Cal in anthropology. Um, so, <laughs> sorry, I'm like shaking right now because um, Williams, Professor Williams, you're the first <laughs> black female anthropologist that I've encountered. Um, in my department that is unheard of. <laughs> and I was usually the only black person in my class. So it's an honor to uh, be with you today. Thank you for coming. Um, my question is, uh, how has your black advocacy work influenced your anthropological work and research? Thank you, Lena. And then we'll hear from uh, Dr. Rila Violet Botsward. <laughs> I'm so proud of you, friend. I just want to first of all say congratulations, soon to be Dr. Dawson. And if we can give another round of applause for this UC postdoc. 
Um, so excited for you. I was just wondering if you could talk more about what those sites of freedom have looked like for black faculty, students, and staff. Um, we know what the repression, um, the exhaustion, we know what that looks like, but can you speak more to what some of your respondents spoke about around finding sites to just be and to be free um, within the university or outside the university? Uh, well, it's no secret that uh, healing black women um, or black woman healing is one of those spaces. Uh, Dr. Rila Valabot's word is often referenced in the work. They're like, yeah. So the healing circles in the university um, that you are a model of have been a space of possibility. Um, people, when I ask folk like, what are sources of support for you? Sometimes, for staff, sometimes it's their supervisor. Supervisors can be like, man, I don't know if I'll be here tomorrow because of my supervisor and they are trying to Kaepernick me. Um, and then other cases where it's like, wow, like I'm actually, su the supervisor will be like, oh yeah, this is part of your paid time. Like this is part of your job. Um, so I think that is really important when thinking about staff members. But generally it's, it's largely outside the university. Um, it's family, that's one of my favorite things. So I was really concerned that like for folk who are parents and um, caregivers that all that the university demands would come at the expense of their family. Often enough, family was so important and demanding that the university got cut off of their labor, that they could not, they could not be available at all hours because they had to care for their kid um, or their partner or whatnot or their, or their, their parents. Um, so I loved that too, that like home, even while that's also a place of um, gendered labor and of like unequal divisions of labor, that other site, disrupted the university's hold and like uh, expectation of labor. So I think that one is one of my favorites because I was, I was concerned that our parents and our caregivers would be, um, that, it would, that their equity work would come at the expense of the family, but the family was like, you cutting that off, right? So that's one of my favorites. So I'd like to answer the first question uh, that came in. Yeah, so I think if I understand you right, your question was about um, why disciplinarily we don't necessarily see a lot of disciplines that support uh, black methods or methods that can be satisfactorily or effectively used to do research on, <laughs> thank you, <laughs> to do research on black populations. Um, I don't know you, but I feel like if you're asking that question based on some of your framing, you probably already know the answer, or at least have some ideas <laughs> about why that is. Okay. <laughs> but I, well, yeah. So I, I want to offer, I guess, a story from my own experience that I think, you know, my background isn't in English, but I think it's instructive to what you're, what you're describing. So when I started graduate school, it was a while ago. It was the late 90s, and I came into my program, and I wanted to. I had this idea that I wanted to a wanted to do a dissertation based on the ways that Black women and girls engaged in resistance to media images, particularly media images of Black femininity. And the response, I thought so, right? And so the response that I got from several faculty members was that that wouldn't work as a dissertation project because there was. There was no evidence that there was any resistance by black women and girls. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That, that there was no evidence of any resistance that wouldn't make a viable or realistic dissertation project. And I needed to pick another course of action. So I did, which actually led me into the uh, area of research that I've been doing over the past 20 years. But I bring that up. Just to say that when I tell people that story now, this is the reaction that I get, right? Because it's ridiculous and it sounds stupid and that's a crazy, dumb response to give. And it changed your whole life. It did, it did. It completely shifted my research trajectory. But it's also a ridiculous response, right? It's a ridiculous response to what is actually a very legitimate dissertation topic. But what I think is most telling is that even when I tell that story in spaces outside of this one, if I'm talking to my colleagues in sociology now, they're like, ew, that's gross. And that was a ridiculous response. And that's completely a legitimate uh, area and inquiry of study. So the point I'm just trying to make is that 
what I, I think about, you know, sociology is not English. There are different disciplines. But I think that there are parallels around how universities writ large construct what gets construed as legitimate, acceptable, viable courses of scholarship. But I also think that when I think over the long term about at least sociology in particular as a discipline, there are marked differences between what sociology was when I started as a graduate student in the late 90s and where I think sociology as a discipline is and is going in 2023. So that may not be of the most comfort to you now as a student you know, trying to engage in this work. But I think what your question suggests to me is that you're situating your research and your project in a temporal place and time in a university structure that has a long history, as all disciplines in American higher education do, of being very anti-black in some specific and some more uh, covert ways. And then that can have implications for what types of methods get selected, what types of projects get selected, what types of research is legitimated and allowed to go forward and what isn't. But what I can say from my experience is that I don't think that that's necessarily completely constant. And I do think that there is at least room for, I don't know if I want to go quite so far as to say optimism, but I, I do think that there's room for acknowledging that in many disciplines, there's a recognition of changing structures and changing norms and changing ways of understanding knowledge and pedagogy and methodology, theory, and so forth. And I do think that there is at least room to think about ways that disciplines may change in ways that mean that what you're experiencing now may not necessarily be kind of a constraining way of thinking about what your research focus has to be over the entire course of your career, if that makes sense. Yeah. I'll try to keep this short. I know we're running out of time. I could talk about this all day. Um, <laughs> it's not an allergy. It's intentional. Um, yeah. uh, so I wrote a piece called Black Feminist Citational Praxis and Disciplinary Belonging. It was published in March in Culture Anthropology, the journal. It directly answers your question, so I'll, I'll try to stop talking about that. Um, and just say that um, when people ask why I'm still in higher ed, because I complain so much about it, it's because of this, because people like Lee, because people like Mark Anthony Neal. I started out studying white kids in hip hop. That's what I came to grad school to study. Um, and it was because people had already made that a legitimate project that I was allowed to do it um, and why I ended up being able to study black women and happiness was because I had a dissertation committee who fought for me to study that as a real thing. So I'm here to try to do the, that same for other folks. Um, and if you notice, like if you go to any major, you know, uh, conference now, we're all over. Like the questions that are being asked are stuff that we've been saying for forever. So they just need to catch up. Um, and so it's important for us to kind of hold the space sometimes until they do. Um, Alina, come see me. Um, uh, the other thing, uh, I was adamant that I would not be in higher ed if I couldn't do my organizing, that I had to do my activism organizing and it had to be part of the work or I just couldn't be here and I had to find another job um, because it just didn't make sense. Like I was one of those people was like, have you seen this place? This place is a mess. How can I be here and just keep my head down and do my, like this is the work. So that's why it is the way it is. And there were a lot of costs to that. And by the grace of God and, and black feminists who organize around me, I'm still here because I almost didn't get tenure because of it. So we could have that conversation. Um, places of joy um, and freedom and liberation. Um, some professional organizations for those graduates to American studies is my happy place because there's so many of us there across a variety of disciplines just trying to build and do work. So if you make it to American studies as a graduate student or undergrad, that will be your happy, uh, maybe a happy place for you. The Associ Association for Black Anthropologists, every year I go to AAA. I don't know what the broader organization is doing. I don't know what they do. I go straight to ABA and in that room, there are 300 black anthropologists who remind me why I am where I am in this discipline that is really messed up. Um, NWS say National Women's Studies is another place that is kind of my space. Um, and then my crew, my crew of people, like my crew of other feminists and other, you know, black folks who are like, am I doing, yep. is this, does this make sense? Yep. Or did this just happen? Like those folks are my pilks. Um, and then black Twitter, black Twitter. <laughs> when I feel like I have nowhere else, when I lived in Colorado and there was nowhere else, it was Facebook and black Twitter. Um, so that's it. Thank y'all for being here today.
Thank you both so much. Uh, briefly, or yeah, some closing things that I'm hearing and that I want to hold, I want the, us to hold together, is also that what black folk do matters. Um, yeah, it's impactful. Uh, Right. Even while in some of the interpersonal things don't change structures, one of one of actually it was Jasmine, the faculty, who said, you know, because anti-blackness um, makes us feel in our bodies that we are not fully human. Sometimes listening to someone means that people can that you address that sen that sense of um, not not being human. Right. So even while the interpersonal may not fix all the issues, the that work is consequential for Black life. Um, as well as all the organizing, right? The organ like so. Th again, thank you to Professor Lee Rayford and Professor Tiana Pichel for creating conditions for us to have these conversations and for us to feel a, a piece of freedom in this moment. Um, and yeah, I love I love the idea of having conditions about whether or not you uh, perform certain labor. Like we may, as much as we may love it and care for it abstractly, like let's be intentional about what conditions we're willing to perform the labor in and, and demand those conditions. There's so much more, but y'all can catch us after. Um, I do want to offer one quick announcement. Um, one of the role, one of the hats I wear is leading this initiative called Black Lives at Cal. And next Thursday, February 16th, um, we're going to do a show and tell of black history based on the memorabilia that we have in our own respective digital and print collections. So come through and experience a little joy and freedom and knowing that you're part of something larger, if that's of interest to you. And let's welcome our esteemed professor, Professor Lee Rayford. That was amazing. Um, sorry, I'm just trying to go back to, oh, I don't know where our list is for next week. At the, end. At the very end, okay, thank you. There we go, okay. Um, I wanna thank Caleb again for putting together such a beautiful panel. Uh, thank you to Drs. Wingfield and Williams for joining us. Oh, I still have a mask on. Okay, I can take this off. Um, this was really beautiful and really right on time. Thank you. Um, next week, we are back um, with Hit to Hit, Battle of Celebrated Rwandan Music Pro Producers, Track Slayer and Dr. Ngaji, um, uh, which will be, is an event curated by one of our postdoctoral fellows, Dr. Victoria Grubbs. Um, that should be uh, a kind of moment, uh, a session of joy. Um, and um, again, please join us again next week. Take some time outside to convene, to fellowship, um, and I want to thank you again. <laughs>